Uh, so a couple of disclosures before we begin. Um, firstly, even in America, I am accused of speaking too fast. I will try to slow down. I will probably fail. Please do stop me if I'm speaking too fast. Um, secondly, as Rishi already said, uh, this is my first trip to India. I've been here for 10 days. I've been in Mumbai for four days. Um, I am terribly, terribly ignorant, right? So uh, I'm not here to tell you what to do. Uh, instead, I'm here to tell you about our experiences in the United States. Um, I think that there are ways in which Mumbai, its culture, its governance, its attitudes are very different than those that we find in the United States. But my experience here over the last 10 days in your country leads to me to suggest that in fact, our attitudes about mobility are exactly the same. And so what this lecture is about really is helping your country and particularly your city avoid feeling the need to go through the exact same steps of industrialization and urbanization that my country and my city suffered through from the 1950s to the present day, a period of time in which America squandered its great wealth and is now having to spend even more money to undo the mistakes of the past. We would hope that you could learn not from our successes in America, but really from our errors. In this presentation, it's really actually about our mistakes and the things that we have learned uh, to do instead to fix those mistakes. So I'm not going to show you um, any pictures of pretty transit-oriented development projects in America. Instead, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my own experience. Um, so I live in San Francisco now. By comparison to Mumbai, it is a tiny little seaside village. Um, but I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, and that's me and my mother. Um, and I grew up in Los Angeles, um, and like all little boys growing up everywhere, I've always been fascinated by mobility. It's, it's something that's captured my imagination from my earliest days. And my imagination was furthered by being exposed to billions of US dollars of television advertising in the 1970s that taught me many things. Um, those ads taught me that owning my own car would someday bring me freedom and autonomy and social status um, and someday sex. <laughs> and the, this attitude about the automobile um, really started early in the United States but carried through much of our culture. Um, when I was in high school, I worked at Disneyland um, in a place, a part of Disneyland, ironically called Tomorrowland. And the most popular ride in Tomorrowland is a ride that remains unchanged since 1955. It is the Autopia ride. And people from all over California drive their cars on freeways, stuck in traffic congestion, and then stand in line to get their tickets to Disneyland, and then stand in line again to ride on a small version of their car, stuck in traffic congestion, and they think this is the most fun thing that one could possibly do. And I know this because I also loved the Autopia ride. And the Autopia ride comes to us from really one place. And it is called the Futurama exhibit, which was the most visited industrial exhibit in the history of the world. Um, these were exhibits at the 1933, 1939, and 1964 World's Fairs in the United States. And these were industrial exhibits sponsored by the General Motors Corporation that reimagined American cities with a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Um, in 1939, a third of the population of the United States showed up to see this exhibit. Extraordinary. Nothing like this has ever happened in American history before or since. 
And it really changed the attitudes of Americans about mobility. In fact, I would argue that the US investment in the interstate highway system, which followed from these exhibits, um, the biggest public works project in world history, was actually one of the wisest investments that my country ever made. It was an extraordinary investment and transformed the country, not only economically, by connecting our cities and regions, it transformed America socially, that the freedom of mobility also resulted in an extreme amount of social mobility. Every single one of my ancestors moved hundreds of miles from the place of their birth. Every single one of my ancestors, going back as far back as we can trace, they all moved. And they reinvented themselves, not only economically finding new work, but socially. They reinvented themselves as people. And this was made possible by the amazing wonder of the car and our investment in highways. There's a kind of beauty of infinite possibility that this promise of endless mobility granted us Americans. And while I complained about the car, it is important not to underestimate its power and its allure. It's also, not important, it's also important not to underestimate the horrible disappointment that we Americans feel when the promise of the freedom of mobility that these auto commercials told us would be true when we bought our car, when in fact we're confronted by the reality of being stuck in horrific traffic congestion as most Americans are every single day. It makes us very, very upset as a people. And this reaction, this, you know, you promised me the open road and you've given me horrific urban traffic congestion makes us very upset. And it makes us demand that something must be done to solve this problem, damn the costs. And so as Americans, we've continued to go back to the polling booth to elect mayors and governors who promise wider highways and to tax ourselves endlessly for wider and wider highways regardless of the financial cost or the social cost on our cities. And the reason for this has to do with a failure of thinking of applying a certain kind of thinking, which I will call object thinking, where the thought is, if I beat my employees, surely productivity will improve. And not thinking through the secondary and tertiary consequences of that decision. If my employees are being lazy, surely if I beat them, they will work harder. Well, that may be true for an hour, but quickly my employees will leave me and uh, I'll be bankrupt. Now, I own a small business. Uh, it is a complicated enterprise. I struggle with how to manage it. Managing a transportation system is infinitely more complicated than managing a small business. And everything that we do in mobility has cascading consequences that are far greater than the immediate primary consequences. And so the first step in solving our problems, the first step about thinking about transit-oriented development is to think in terms of systems and not in terms of objects. Um, and this leads us um, to a couple of other key points that I want to make. Mobility has no purpose in and of itself. Um, simply having people go around in circles serves no social good. Mobility, I would argue, is simply an investment strategy. It is an investment strategy that helps us to achieve many social goods. Um, in fact, I would argue that the three biggest impacts of mobility investment include land value, first and foremost. I am primarily in the business of generating land value. Secondly, I have a huge impact on social equity and social opportunity. Um, there's probably no more effective way at increasing um, social uh, equity and opportunity for disadvantaged people than investing in mobility, and that's a whole other lecture. The third thing that we do is public health. My uh, friends who are medical doctors complain that I, as a transportation professional, have far greater 
impact on public health than the entire medical profession does. The medical profession is responsible for cleaning up the problem after it has already occurred. The mobility profession is responsible for keeping people healthy to begin with. We know that the fundamental requirement of the human body in our daily life is to take about 10,000 steps per day. And if we design our cities where 10,000 steps a day is something that you do naturally, rather than something that you have to drive to the gymnasium to walk on the treadmill, that the public health outcomes are phenomenally positive. And we see this very much in the United States from the data where clinical obesity rates in the United States in 1985 were low. We were a healthy people uh, as auto ownership started to uh, rise rapidly and start to peak. Um, and as the data continues over time, we notice that we had to keep changing the scale on the map where in you know, 1997, uh, almost a quarter of adults in Mississippi are clinically obese um, in 2000. Five, it's over 30%, 2009, and so on. In fact, these trends have continued to get worse um, into 2015. And while correlation is not causation, the strongest correlation that we see between obesity rates, diabetes, and other cardiovascular disease, the strongest correlation that we see is between vehicle kilometers traveled, rates of walking, and all of these uh, physical diseases of the human body that are the result of, in part, bad diet, but overwhelmingly the result of sedentary lifestyles, people not walking every day. And so in order to solve these problems of social equity and economic efficiency and public health, and to live out the promise that transit-oriented development offers us, I offer you a few solutions that we have learned the hard way in America to think about. And the first step is really to recognize once again that mobility does not serve an independent utility. We are really in the business of economics. We're in the business of predicting and accommodating social behavior. And I would argue that Transport is much better seen as a branch of economics than it is as a branch of civil engineering. Now granted, civil engineering is an extremely important part of what we do, but the underlying principles of mobility really have everything to do with economics. And one place to start is to recognize just how incredibly inefficient mobility is in most countries. So, for those of you who own private cars, or at least from the data in the United States, private cars are only used about 5% of the time. Um, about 95% of the time, cars are parked in the United States. And of that 5% of the time that they are used, they're typically only used at about 20 to 25% of capacity. So in the mobility sector in the United States, we are using about 1% of its economic capacity far worse than any sector in the economy. In fact, worse by an order of magnitude. Extremely inefficient. We also strangely in transport forget that the laws of supply and demand apply to the commodity of mobility in the exact same way that they apply to every other good, right? So we learn from Adam Smith that there is a supply curve and a demand curve and that our task for um, balancing supply and demand, ensuring adequate supply, is to identify the lowest price that puts supply and demand into balance. It's finding that equilibrium point. But in transport, we refuse to use price to balance supply and demand. In transport, it is the only commodity where we use the Soviet communist method of balancing supply and demand. And instead of using price, we use your time. So congestion is really best seen as the equilibrium point between the supply curve and the demand curve, saying that we're going to waste your time as opposed to having you spend your money. So congestion occurs when supply equals demand, right? Congestion is not an infrastructure problem. Congestion is an economic problem. And, and as an economic problem, the only opportunities that we have to solve congestion 
are economic solutions, not infrastructure solutions. If we continue to underprice mobility, demand will continue to exceed supply, and we will assume that you would rather waste your time than spend your money in order to make the mobility systems work. We also have a fixation in transport. If this is a peak period, peak direction, car flow uh, on an arterial roadway, and you can see the morning peak over there on the left and then an evening peak, we have a very, very fine fixation in the mobility world of fixating on the peak of the peak, the peak one hour of the day. And if that, in that peak one hour, we have the demand for mobility exceeding the supply, that's level of service F, and, and this is all we care about. And we will spend an immense amount of money pushing that red line up in order to expand capacity, in order to get that little bit uh, just below the red line. But of course, we ignore what, would, what any economist would be paying attention to in any other sector of society. All of the other times of day and in the opposite direction when there is plenty of capacity, right? If we treated mobility like a normal commodity, our task would be not pushing up that red line to expand capacity to accommodate a very, very small peak. Our task would be to spread that line out to make best use of this very expensive capital facility of the roadway. Now, one of the things that keeps us from behaving like good economists in transport is we're not measuring the right thing. And so in order to make progress on transit-oriented development, it's critically important that we look at our measures of success. In the United States, um, historically, we have focused on a single indicator of success, which is intersection level of service which is graded on an A to F letter scale. And what level of service does is it tries to calculate the average seconds of delay that a car experiences as a result of congestion in the peak one hour as measured off of the peak 15 minutes. So level of service is a measure of vehicle delay, not person delay. And it measures only congestion-related delay, not stopping at a red light or being lost or circling around for parking, um, with the implication being that level service F is failure, just like on your daughter's elementary school report card. And this means, of course, that as transportation professionals, the best that we could possibly do, our ultimate success, is to design a road like this, that looks like this in the peak hour. Now, never mind that I just spent about five times as much money on this road as I should have, and that I've dragged down the property values adjacent and made it impossible for the street to work for pedestrians. But for cars in the peak, awesome, good job. But a street like this, which is the highest grossing retail street in California, that street used to be four travel lanes, and the city reduced it to two. It is at level of service F pretty much all day long. But this city recognizes that the primary transportation performance metric for this street is not level of service for cars, it's retail sales per square meter for all of the businesses along the street. The purpose of this street, really the only purpose of this street, is facilitating retail success, which is how this city makes its tax revenue and a place that all of its residents love. No one in this entire city would want to uh, make this street four lanes again because it would mean making it harder to get across the street as a pedestrian um, and therefore making it less likely to be successful as a retail street. And of course, Level of service for cars ignores pedestrians. Pedestrians do not exist except insofar as they interrupt the flow of cars. Um, moreover, if you're a person on board a 40 passenger bus, you are valued at 1 40th the value of a person driving alone in a car because level of service is a measure of vehicle delay, not person delay. So it's important as you're thinking about how to measure success, to recognize that what's important depends upon your perspective, with the traffic engineer seeing things perhaps rather differently than an economist would. An economist who would say a street that 
has a perfect balance of demand and supply at the peak one hour, that street is perfectly designed. To have made it wider would have been wasteful, right? So level service F from an economic perspective is ideal. But more importantly, there are many other metrics that you can use to decide whether your transportation system is successful in meeting your goals. In fact, I would argue that if you have policy goals, if those goals are not reflected in your transportation performance metrics, your goals do not exist. Your goals do not exist unless they are measurable. So every time you come up with a policy goal, you must have a way of measuring the degree to which it can be achieved, which means that you need data. And the best set of performance metrics are the metrics that are rooted in existing or easily achievable data that speak to all of your policy language. In California, um, happily last year, uh, we passed legislation to eliminate level of service as a performance metric and to replace it with a simple metric of per capita vehicle kilometers traveled. This, is, this will be the primary metric that we use to measure the impact of new development, particularly at transit-oriented development um, throughout the state of California. Now, it's great to have metrics, but in order to use your metrics effectively, you also need to have good analytical tools. Um, and it's important to recognize that while travel demand models are essential to our business, they are only as good as you understand their strengths and weaknesses, and they are really only useful at comparing different alternatives against each other. Travel demand models do not predict the future. Um, in fact, the, it is impossible for them to predict the future because they are rooted in the trends of the past. And if you behave exactly like your grandparents did, well, if that were true, then our travel demand models would be much better. But somehow I think that your grandchildren are probably not going to behave exactly like you do. So it's important to recognize the model's strengths and weaknesses. The key area where most travel demand models go wrong is in what we call induced or latent demand. So as somebody from Los Angeles, I hate sitting in traffic congestion. It makes me cranky. And even I will think, you know, we, should, we really need to raise money and widen this road so I don't have to sit in this horrible congestion. So, you know, I go to the polls about every four years and vote to increase my taxes so that the roads could be widened um, and that driving can be faster. So once driving is faster, however, people make different choices. So, you know, that new restaurant that opened across town that we would not have gone to before because of the traffic, now why don't we go to that restaurant? Or, honey, why don't we move to the bigger, cheaper house farther away because we could still get to work on time? So the problem with faster driving is it means more people drive and the result of more people driving is that there is congestion, which makes us sad, and the cycle continues. Um, Los Angeles recently spent over one billion US dollars to widen Interstate 405, and they didn't even get the usual six months of traffic relief. The highway opened more congested on day one than it was before they spent a billion dollars widening the highway. That is induced demand. The other thing that is remarkable in the United States is we experienced peak driving in 2005. Rates of driving um, are in rapid decline, particularly in our cities. Um, and while they fluctuate a lot based upon the price of gasoline, young people today have a radically different attitude about driving than my generation did. In fact, my generation was really the last one in America to believe it when the television commercials told us that buying a car would bring us freedom, autonomy, social status, and sex. There is something that brings us all of those things today, and that's one of these, right? And the car is the only thing that takes me away from one of these. So the automobile industry in the United States is in a panic that their lie has been exposed, that the car is a tool 
It's not an extension of your personality. It is a tool. And young people absolutely will drive if the car is their only option. But why drive when you could call Uber and have somebody drive for you? Why own a car when in my low density neighborhood in San Francisco, there are a hundred cars that I can rent within a two block walk of my house. My neighbors rent their cars uh, and I just order it on my phone and then swipe my phone on the car and if I need a truck to go to the hardware store or if I need an Alfa Romeo for a fancy date, that car is available to me whenever I want and I don't have to go through the hassle anymore of owning a car. I own a car because of nostalgia, right? In the future, the only people who will own a car are the same people who own a horse or a boat today, right? People, you know, like, I love cars. I am, I am nostalgic about my car. I will keep it until it finally dies. But it's not for any rational reason, and I respect that. So, now, some preliminaries set aside. Let's talk really about the design of transit-oriented development. The number one rule of transit-oriented development has nothing about transit. The first rule of transit-oriented development is entirely about the pedestrian. Transit-oriented development is just pedestrian-oriented development that happens to be near transit. And so the first rule is never, ever sacrifice the quality of the walk experience in order to accommodate any other mode of transportation. Do not sacrifice the quality of the pedestrian experience in order to improve transit. Certainly don't sacrifice the quality of the walk experience in order to improve driving. It only sets you back. It only harms the system as a whole. The other thing that is interesting about transit-oriented development in the United States is the mobility benefits of TOD are mostly about the walk trip and not about the transit trip. And that has to do with the mix of uses. And so this is something that you are the masters at here in India, of making sure that the needs of daily life are always within walking distance. So make sure that in your planning, uh, you include all of the needs of daily life within walking distance. Now an area here in India that needs a lot of help is my favorite topic, which is parking. Uh, this is an area that is absolutely essential if you want transit-oriented development to work. And there are, uh, this could be a whole day-long lecture about all of the fixes that you need to make, but let me uh, go through a couple of them. One, and potentially the most important, is the importance of managing on-street parking, the, the parking that happens within the public right-of-way. This is a chaotic mess uh, in, in India. At least here in Mumbai, it is 100 times better than it is in Delhi, which is a complete disaster in terms of uh, parking management. That zone between the pedestrian footpath and the moving lanes of traffic, that entire zone, requires very careful thinking about design and even more careful management. It is a hugely important zone. It's where your taxi loading occurs, it's where vegetable vendors uh, uh, go, it's where the auto rickshaw drivers hang out, it's where on-street parking occurs, particularly for short-term parking. There's a lot that happens there, and if you don't manage it well, you will both make your city impossible to walk in, as is certainly the case in Delhi, but it also significantly impacts your ability to move traffic in the street. I could double the traffic capacity of Mumbai streets tomorrow, double the capacity of your streets, just by managing what's happening in that zone between the through traffic and the pedestrian footpath. It is a chaotic mess. So the first place to start in managing that zone is recognizing that it has value. You have to price all of your parking. It is an incredibly valuable public resource that you are giving away uh, to uh, the most privileged members of your society in many cases um, to the detriment of your society as a whole. So what that means is 
leapfrogging ahead the United States in terms of technology and not installing these crazy things which we still have in our streets, but recognizing that anyone who has a car in your country also has a cell phone and you could pay for your parking with your cell phone and your license plate, buy as much time as you need. If you guess too high, you get a refund. If you guess too low, you can add more time wherever you are. The technology these days is fantastic. There's no excuse anymore not to manage your parking. It is also always cheaper to use technology to manage your parking than it is to build new parking. There's probably no need to build any new parking in Mumbai when you have such incredible opportunities to better manage your existing parking supply. And this is true really in any city in the world. You're not unique. We're a little farther ahead in the US, but we're basically, we were where you were about 10 years ago. Now, it's important to recognize that again, the laws of supply and demand apply to parking. And the right price for parking is always the lowest price that helps you achieve an availability target. The right price for parking is always the lowest price that makes sure that there's about 15% of spaces empty on every block, in every parking lot, in every parking garage. If you charge more than that price, you'll end up with a lot of empty parking spaces and angry merchants uh, and uh, a bad economy. If you charge less than that price, you'll end up with spaces that are too full and people driving around in circles trying to find a space and angry merchants and an, and a, uh, and an unhappy economy. The right price is the lowest price that achieves your availability target. And that means the price needs to vary by block. It also needs to vary by time of day. And it means that you should charge for parking whenever there is scarcity of parking. If on a Saturday there's plenty of parking, parking can be free on Saturday. If on Friday night at midnight in Bandra, the spaces are all full, you can charge for parking until midnight. That's fine in order to make sure that it's always possible to find a parking space. My guess is in your most popular districts here in Mumbai, 30% of the traffic is, is people driving around in circles needlessly trying to find a parking space. Keep in mind that the difference between complete gridlock and free flow traffic is 10%. If I take the most congested street out there and I remove just 10% of the vehicles, traffic flows smoothly again. Parking management is essential to any traffic management strategy. There is no need to build new roads manage the roads and the parking that you have. Now, as soon as you tell people that you're charging for parking, they will accuse you of being evil, money-grubbing bastards. Uh, the most difficult thing for any city to do. Uh, I have done this, I have survived, barely. Um, so it's critically important to invest the revenue that you raise off of parking into things that matter, right? Don't just put it in your pockets, don't just put it in the municipal general fund, invest it in local improvements um, or in accessibility improvements to people who don't drive. This is really, really important politically. Um, it's also uh, really important, and this is, um, I think, one of the things that uh, Mumbai is better at than most cities, is again, this really interesting zone between the pedestrian footpath on the left and the moving lanes of traffic on the right so much can happen in that zone, um, including in California, where we allow merchants to put cafe seating in the parking lane during the lunchtime and then pull those tables back in at night when they close and have it revert back to parking. Um, another thing that is important for transit-oriented development is there is no need to force developers to build more parking than they want. So long as you are managing your on-street parking, minimum parking requirements serve no public good. All they do is add to the cost of housing, add to the cost of commercial leases, exacerbate your traffic congestion, and make your streets uglier. Um, in fact, not only should you eliminate minimum parking requirements in transit-oriented development, you should also start looking at imposing um, parking maximums. Um, 
It's also important to recognize that transit-oriented development behaves in a very different way than conventional development. If you assume that the same kind of people are moving into TOD as want to move into conventional development, you will not market your product correctly. You want a lot of what we call self-selection of households with fewer cars moving into transit-oriented projects to take advantage of the transit, not just to take advantage of the prestige, and then ignore the transit and drive just as much as they used to. Um, so cities all over North America now are recognizing the importance of parking maximums, that they establish parking maximums based upon roadway capacity. There's no point in allowing more parking than you have roadway capacity in order to get cars to and from those parking spaces. It's also, particularly in a city like San Francisco, a very uh, key part of our housing affordability strategy. So in San Francisco, uh, there are no minimum parking requirements uh, in the urban part of the city anywhere. And parking maximums for residential vary from 0.25 to 0.75 spaces per unit. Um, and commercial parking maximums are mostly zero. We typically do not allow commercial parking at all. And where it is allowed, it's limited to 8% uh, of gross floor area or about 0 0.25 spaces per 100 square meters. No, per 100 square meters, yeah. 0 0.25 per 100 square meters. Um, other key points about parking, again, Never let parking degrade the pedestrian environment. So design your parking well. Uh, be careful with driveways. Um, require in transit-oriented projects the price of parking be separated from uh, commercial leases and from uh, residential uh, leases and sale. Um, build car sharing into your projects. And I'm so glad to see car sharing uh, and Uber both uh, succeeding here in India. This is really, I think, the biggest solution at transit-oriented development projects. There's no point in a TOD in owning your own car when in your building there are a fleet of cars that you can grab whenever you need one um, and grab the right car for the job, whether that's the truck or the Alfa Romeo. Another key point about, is about transit itself. Um, and that is making sure that it's not only fast and frequent and reliable, but that it also offers a comparable level of dignity that we can find in the car. And no one really understands this better than the French. The French transit vehicles are exquisite. It is such a pleasure to ride on the bus in France, in part because when I'm riding on the bus in France, I feel like I'm a part of the whole celebration of the city. The windows have floor to ceiling glass. I can, I can see and be seen. I could have a little flirtation. It's fantastic. But the most important aspect about transit is recognizing its sheer geometric magic. Now, the automobile will always be an important part of mobility in Mumbai, but you need to recognize that every time a person drives in a car, they displace 10 other people from being able to move in your city. It takes up about 10 times as much space per person to move somebody in a car than in any other mode of transportation. So it's not that walking and biking and public transportation are good, are somehow morally superior. This is not really about ideology. It is about the sheer geometry of your city. The math of Mumbai will not work unless you emphasize the most space efficient modes of transportation. As your city grows, if you continue to have the same array of cars and bikes and buses, your city street system will move fewer and fewer people. As your city grows, you have no choice but to emphasize the most space efficient modes of transportation. And again, this is a math problem, a math problem that has no solution other than greater space efficiency. Um, and you've seen all the charts uh, about how many people per square meter it takes to move folks by different modes. It's a pretty fixed reality. And while autonomous vehicles will help us with this, Autonomous vehicles improve the geometry only by about 30%.
and we need that geometry to be improved by about a thousand percent. So autonomous vehicles are part of the solution for making rapid transit work even better uh, in uh, uh, streets throughout your city. Another key point uh, that cities around the world are realizing is that the rules for safe, efficient mobility in cities are contradictory to the rules of safe roadways in the countryside. And so cities around the world are adopting urban street design manuals that are completely different in principle to the more standard highway design manuals that are used by state governments and you know, for building highways. Um, this is a big change that is happening in America. Um, and the uh, National Association of City Transportation Officials is releasing, I think next month, the new Global Street Design Manual, in part based upon the fantastic work that Abu Dhabi has done, uh, another country that had adopted all of the bad 1950s thinking from America and leapfrogged the United States, realizing that that mid-century American thinking was not serving Abu Dhabi well at all. Um, the final point that I would like to leave you with goes back to my original point, which is about we got into this problem in part because we were sold a bill of goods in the 1930s by the General Motors Corporation. The General Motors Corporation realizes that they can't sell this ideology anymore in my country. So they've come to sell it to yours. And so I would urge you to look very carefully at the problems this vision has had and imposed upon American society and to look past our mistakes of the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s and leap ahead to create a new vision of the city of the future that looks at new technology that respects your own unique local culture but also recognizes that part of our common humanity is this insatiable demand for unlimited mobility regardless of the consequences. I would urge you also to recognize that a vision of the city of the future needs to take into account fundamental human constants. One fundamental human constant is the need for the human body. Our bodies need to walk every day. There's also a fundamental human constant of the human mind and uh, the fact that we are social primates. We crave public sociable experiences. There is nothing we find more interesting than each other. But I think w w the most interesting aspect though of the human mind is there's only one experience that we never tire of, and it's a very simple experience. How many times have you seen a sunset? We've seen them hundreds and hundreds of times, and yet every single time we see a sunset, we are gobsmacked as if we had never seen one ever before. The human brain never tires of beauty. It's a very simple constant in our experience, and so I would argue that because things that we find beautiful, we cherish and maintain. And no city is as sustainable as a city that is cherished and well-maintained. And that the fundamental aspect of sustainability in any city, anywhere in the world, because we are all human beings, is to make that city beautiful. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you.